Hey everyone, Will here. So for today's video, we are going to be analyzing the history behind the iconic American song, Lift Every Voice and Sing. That means we're going to be going over all aspects of this musical piece, including the origins of the song, the purpose of this song, and the legacy of the song. So without further ado, let's begin. So the original idea behind this song came from American writer James Weldon Johnson. The song was written in a very polarized time in American history. At the end of the 20th century, post-Civil War reconstruction efforts were being dismantled. Important organizations initiated by U.S. President Abraham Lincoln, like the Freedmen's Bureau, were quickly dismantled by Lincoln's successor, U.S. President Andrew Johnson. The U.S. Supreme Court case Plessy v. Ferguson also saw the legal upholding of racial segregation across the country. On top of this, the initiation of Jim Crow laws severely limited black Americans' employment opportunities. Reacting to this hostility, many black Americans began to form their own schools, churches, newspapers, and musical groups. Two important American icons, James Weldon Johnson and John Rosamond Johnson, were heavily involved in the creation and development of these groups. James Weldon Johnson was a poet, lawyer, and school principal. At this time, John Rosamond Johnson was a music teacher. In 1899, James Weldon Johnson set out to write a poem commemorating former U.S. President Abraham Lincoln. While he was writing this poem, he came up with an additional idea as well. James began writing about the struggles that black Americans were facing. James wanted his poem to emphasize the willpower and strength that black Americans possessed. When he finished his poem, James asked his brother John to turn his poem into a song. When the song was finished, it reportedly moved James to tears. The song was given the title, Lift Every Voice and Sing. The final song consisted of three main verses, each of which covered important milestones of the black American experience in 20th century America. In my own reading of the piece, I've conducted a personal analysis of my interpretation for each of James Weldon Johnson's words in each stanza. The first verse was a love letter to the concepts of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness that were discussed in the U.S. Declaration of Independence. The first line, lift every voice and sing, can be interpreted to be a call to bring equality and love into the world. The second line, Toll Earth and Heaven Ring, can be seen as a reference to making God proud by following his teachings. The third line, Ring with the Harmonies of Liberty, can be seen as a call to bring liberty to all Americans. The use of the word liberty is particularly symbolic because it refers to guaranteed rights and protections that were promised under the U.S. Constitution. These were rights and protections that were promised, but not given, to black Americans. The fourth line, Let Our Rejoicing Rise, can be seen as a call for optimism amid the challenges of the times. The fifth line, High as the Listening Sky, seems to invoke the concept of heaven. The sixth line, Let It Resound Loud as the Rolling Sea, uses the word rolling sea to signify a loud call for love. The seventh line, sing a song full of faith that the dark past has taught us, can be seen as a call for faith and hope, even in the face of historic injustices. The eighth line, sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us, can be seen as a reflection on the large amounts of progress made, thanks to the work of American heroes like economist and educator Booker T. Washington. The ninth line, facing the rising sun of our new day begun, 
can be seen as a reference for how each new day brings new possibilities for reaching full equality. The tenth line, let us march on till victory is won, can be seen as a call of support for the public marches staged by civil rights leaders. The second verse serves as a reminder to never forget the suffering and challenges of the past. The first line, Stony the Road We Trod, uses the word road to allude to the difficult history that black Americans endured during and after the transatlantic slave trade. The second line, Bitter the Chastening Rod, uses the word chastening rod to refer to the horrifying whippings that occurred on plantations. The third line, felt in the day that hope unborn had died, refers to people's unfulfilled hope fading away. This is meant to symbolize how racism wore down the remaining hopes and dreams of the many people that it had affected. The fourth line, yet with a steady beat, uses the phrase steady beat to refer to the gradual progress that the country has made in achieving equality. The fifth line, have not our weary feet, starts asking a rhetorical question to the listener. This question continues into the next line. The sixth line, come to the place for which our father sighed, finishes this question by asking if the work of forefathers helped black Americans finally live in a place free from slavery. This is a rhetorical question since both the listener and Johnson know the answer is yes. The seventh line, we have come over a way that with tears has been watered, refers to how black Americans had overcome the horrors of slavery that their forefathers were subjected to. James Weldon Johnson is also seeking to remind the listener of how the fight for freedom was not an easy one. The eighth line, we have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered, uses the word blood to refer to lynching and other acts of mob violence that black Americans endured. The ninth line, out from the gloomy past, till now we stand at last, refers to how black Americans had overcome so many hardships. This line also refers to how James Weldon Johnson was still hopeful for the future of his country. The tenth line, where the white gleam of our bright star is cast, refers to newfound hope that existed for America's civil rights movement. The third verse is a call for the truest form of American patriotism and invokes many themes related to Christian faith. The first line, God of our weary years, speaks to God who watched over black Americans as they lived through difficult times. The second line, God of our silent tears, explores the role that emotional expression played in congressional worship for black Americans. In the 1900s, many people believed that emotional religious expression was wrong. James Weldon Johnson calls the tears silent since he is describing a Victorian style of worship that inspired prayer of that time. The third line, thou who has brought us this far on the way, refers to the blessings that God has given to the people who needed them most. The fourth line, thou who has by thy might, refers to the divine powers of God. The fifth line, let us into the light, refers to how God can bring people closer to moral goodness. The sixth line, keep us forever in the path we pray, is a wish the speaker makes, hoping that him and others continue to follow the teachings of God forever. The seventh line, lest our feet stray from the places our God where we met thee, is a hope that God supports the speaker and others in their journey, unless they lose sight of their current mission. The eighth line, lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world, is the hope that God supports the speakers and others in their journey, unless materialistic desires tarnish their virtuosity. This line strongly emphasizes the importance of having spiritual discipline in everyday life. It also speaks to the need for all people to avoid the unrighteous pitfalls of the world. The ninth line, shadowed beneath the hand, emphasizes the need to bring out the best in people. The tenth line, may we forever stand, can be interpreted as a call for prosperity for all people. The eleventh line, true to our God, 
can be seen as a call to stay true to the teachings of God. The twelfth line, true to our native land, is a call to live up to the ideals and potential of the United States of America. This was a view that civil rights leaders and integrationists like Martin Luther King Jr. firmly stood by. The final song also utilized an iconic musical accompaniment composed by James Weldon Johnson's brother, John Rosamond Johnson. The original composition of the song was written in A-flat major, which is an expressive key that has been used in a lot of spiritual and gospel music. The melody of Lift Every Voice and Sing also incorporates word paintings. A word painting is a technique of musically depicting words in a text. This means that the music somewhat matches the words being sung. This can be seen when the phrase, lift every voice and sing, is always sung on an ascending line. The word painting technique continues into the next section of the song, when a mournful minor key is incorporated in recognition of historic injustices and death that are mentioned in the lyrics. The original musical accompaniment also utilizes tight, layered harmonies, which were a hallmark of many original African-American choral songs. The song finally uses a recitative style throughout the latter portion of its music. This is an important musical technique that entails lyrical singing that matches the way in which a phrase or word would be naturally spoken. This can be seen in the performance of the line we can come over a way that with tears has been watered. After that, the Johnson brothers passed their song onto New York publisher Edward B. Marks, who mimeographed copies of the song for the two brothers. The song was then taught to and sung by a chorus of 500 school children from the Stanton School at Jacksonville, Florida. Following this, James Weldon Johnson and his brother, John Rosmond Johnson, moved to New York. However, despite this move, the school children of the Stanton School continued singing their song. Many of these school children grew up and became teachers, teaching the song to new children. Within 20 years, the song quickly became one of the most popular hymns in the South. As this was happening, the song was boosted by powerful Black American organizations like the National Association of Colored Women's Club, as well as individuals like Booker T. Washington. Even during an era of immense segregation, the song was sung in many black Southern churches and even some white Southern churches. According to English professor Timothy Askew, many of these churches wrote to Johnson, telling him that they were singing his popular song. In 1919, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP, dubbed the song a national anthem for black Americans. Soon enough, Lift Every Voice and Sing would become an iconic American song. In 1929, Lift Every Voice and Sing was sung in support of the unionization of black American porters. Then, in 1939, American sculptor Augusta Savage received a commission for the New York World's Fair and created a 16-foot plastic sculpture called Lift Every Voice and Sing. Unfortunately, however, Savage did not have the funds to move and store the sculpture or to cast it in bronze. This caused it to be destroyed at the end of the fair, with the fair's other temporary installations. The music from Lift Every Voice and Sing was also featured in the 1939 boxing film, Keep Punching. In the 1950s, Lift Every Voice and Sing became a major symbol of the civil rights movement. The song was sung during organizational meetings for the Montgomery bus boycott and was quoted in several speeches by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In Maya Angelou's 1969 autobiography, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, Lift Every Voice and Sing is sung by the audience and students 
at Maya's 8th grade graduation, when the educational aspirations of Angelou's predominantly black graduating class were publicly berated. Lift Every Voice and Sing would hold a strong place in black American culture in the decades to come, with iconic American artists like Ray Charles, Aretha Franklin, Kim Weston, and Stevie Wonder all performing covers for the song. Today, the song has been used in a variety of mediums. The 1989 Spike Lee film, Do the Right Thing, featured a 30-second cover of the song, played on a solo saxophone by Branford Marsalis during the opening credits. The song was also quoted by Reverend Joseph Lowry during U.S. President Barack Obama's inauguration in 2009. Overall, Lift Every Voice and Sing remains one of the most powerful symbols of the civil rights movement. It also remains a highly celebrated work within many Christian-based faith congregations across the country. Today, the song is featured in 39 different Christian hymnals and is sung in churches all across North America. It has also become a common tradition for many to sing Lift Every Voice and Sing on Juneteenth of every year. Thank you for checking out our video. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, comment, and subscribe for more additional content. If you have any ideas for a future video topic, please leave a comment and let me know what you would like to see me cover next. I'm really hoping to grow this channel and provide you all with more content in the future, and your support means the world to me. Thanks everyone!